everybody. Welcome to the night's annual membership meeting of the Eastern Division. Good to see everyone. We're still, it's just seven o'clock now. We're still waiting for people to come online. So just be patient with us. I see some people are putting in the chat box where they're from. I see Diane from my home hill at Waterville Valley. I've got Stowe, I've got uh, Double H Ranch, Stratton, Wheeling, West Virginia, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Had a chance to get down to those spots this year. We're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Pat's Peak, we got Blue Mountain. Hello there, Howard. I saw Joan Heaton's on the line. That woman is everywhere. I don't know how she does it. She's just amazing. Cannon, Snowshoe, West Virginia, Gore, Hunter, got a sugar loaf coming to us, Winter Place, another Waterville Valley, another Stowe and Mount Snow. Oh, we got a Lyobriti, <laughs> a little typo in there. Hidden Valley, Catalucci. How's everybody doing? We're gearing up for a great February vacation, President's holiday. It's going to be fantastic. People are eager to go skiing. They're and skiing and riding, I should say. They're excited to be outside. COVID numbers have maybe calmed down a little bit. And people feel like being outdoors is the place to be. Hello there, Dan Early. Good to see you. Dan was one of our award winners at the Pro Jam event. He won the Muller Award. Uh, he and his wife were, were joint winners of that. So congratulations to them. Thanks. Hey, Charlie, what's up, Chuck? Charlie Wheeler and Michelle from Waterville Valley. Thank you very much to everybody who's joining us. Hey, Kathy, um, Laura Began has her hand up. Maybe she has a quick question before we start. Awesome. Hi, how are you? Excellent, Laura, how you doing? Great, I was just curious of uh, the schedule, if you're ever gonna be at Sunday River at this season at all. I am hoping to, but I'm not, I'm not positive yet, but uh, okay. I wanted to take care of um, some of the bigger, like longer stretches that needed to be like a week long trip. Sunday River is the sort of place I can get to in a day. And oh, cool. so I want to look at the schedule and see, you know, if there's some events coming up there. Cause I like to kind of coincide my trips with events that are going on. And so I know typically Sunday River has some exams in later March and that might be a great time to stop over. Okay, great, thank you. As we got people joining on, uh, one of the things that you'll see coming out in uh, during the February week, we're gonna do a, a contest, a social media contest. And we're gonna ask you, I'll give you a sample of it when we put the contest out there, but I'm gonna ask you to hold up a sign, take a picture. The sign's going to say, go with a pro at and your resort. And the, the resort that gets the most number of pictures posted up with that saying on it, will be the next place that I'm going to go on my listening tour. So, um, or maybe not necessarily the next, but they will definitely be on the list for this season. So that should be a fun contest. So keep your eyes open for that on social media. If you're looking for me to make a trip to your neck of the woods. Cool. Excellent. Well, it's almost five past. So I think we should go ahead and get started. And uh, I've got some support with me tonight. I've got Don Haranga, who is the Director of Education and Programs, joining me, and also Karen Haranga, who is the Director of Member Services and Communications. And both of them are going to be able to help me out when it gets to the question and answer portion of tonight. And they're also going to be keeping an eye on the chat box. If you've got questions before we get to that portion, you can put them in there. Or they're also going to be looking to make sure we get people invited into the session. So if you don't know who I am, I'm Kathy Brennan. I'm the new CEO of the Eastern Division of the Professional Ski Instructor Association and the American Association of Snowboard Instructors. And I've been in the job now since October 4th, and it has been a wild and wonderful ride at this point. I've really enjoyed it. And I wanted to take a little bit of time tonight in our annual membership meeting. I wanted to share with you some of the things that I've learned in the in the four months basically that I've been on the job when I've been out on my listening tour. Wanna to share with you how, how things are going with the organization. And, and then I wanna take some time to open up the floor so that you guys can answer any questions that you might have. I know there's some things going on. We've got a new assessment process and the unified assessment form. 
And so there might be questions associated with that or anything else that we might be able to help you with. So um, to kick things off, I've got a little bit of a presentation that I'm gonna share with you. So let me just share my screen here. So some of you might've heard this before, but when I applied for the job, one of the things that I did is I put together my vision of what I'd like to see the organization move toward. And it, that vision has three parts. The first part of that vision is that I want members, you guys, to want to choose to participate in more educational opportunities. Not because you have to, because it's your mandatory re-up, but because you want to, because it's an amazing educational experience. The second piece of my vision is I want all instructors, whether they're a member or a non-member, to want to feel like they're part of our community, to want to look at this community and say, that's a group I want to belong to. So even if they can't maybe necessarily afford the dues or they can't keep up with the re-ups and participate, they still look at this community as a group of people that makes them feel welcome, excited, engaged with being snow sports instructors. And the third part of my vision is, is looking at our industry partners. And our industry partners are the resort operators, they're the National Ski Patrol, they're the race teams out there, they're the ski shops and boot fitters and, and those people and wanting to be sure that they understand and value our education and certification programs and how we are all working together to make more people feel like skiing and riding is a thing that they wanna do. It's not something that they come in and they try it and they check it off and say, okay, bucket list done they actually decide this is the way they want to spend their winters participating in our wonderful sport. So realizing as I came into this job that these first couple of months, I was going to have uh, most of the work had been done in terms of setting up all the clinics and everything that was going to be running. And so I thought this was a great opportunity for me to go out and to meet with the different members, meet with the different stakeholders to first validate if my vision was on track and then secondly, figure out different ideas that are gonna help me to promote the organization toward this vision. So considering that I have about eight months to sit at my desk and think about it, I wanted to take this first couple of months to go on my great listening tour. And for any of you who might've been following my escapades through Facebook, or social media, um, you'll see that I've traveled around quite a bit I began going way down to our most southern resorts. It's starting at Cataloochee, over Gatlinburg Beach and Sugar, Winter Place, up to Seven Springs, over to Blue and back home. And then there was a second trip where I went back down south, where I went to um, Timberline, Canaan, Massanutten, Wintergreen, Snowshoe, uh, Wisp on the way home. I've also been up to a couple of places in the Northeast where I'm from, Waterville, Cannon, Plume, Stowe, Killington, um, uh, Mount Snow. And what my goal during all of these meetings is to meet with different stakeholders, people who are willing to talk to me. In some cases, I've had the opportunity to talk to the resort owners and the presidents. In other cases, I've just gone out on the hill with just a couple of the people from the snow sports staff. In other cases, it's been a variety of people from the adaptive program to the regular ski school and chances to talk to supervisors, directors, resort operators along the way. The goal is to talk to all of them to gather information. And what I told everybody when I was out there is I, there are no bad ideas. I can't guarantee that I can do anything about it or that it might not take me five years in order to accomplish some of these goals or, or more but there are no bad ideas. I'm looking for how can we as an organization increase our value to you as a member, to the guests that you're teaching, to the resorts that you're working for and the industry as a whole. I also, as I was out on this tour, wanted to be able to assess how the rollout of the new national standards was going. Do people know about it? Are you aware that the process has changed, that there's a new unified assessment form? Hang on a second, getting ahead of me here. Uh, I'll just leave it right here. So um, the, the other things that I wanted to do on this listening tour is I also wanted to, um, I, I mentioned that I wanted to talk to those different stakeholders. I wanted to get information. I wanted to find out about our national standards and how that's going. And I also wanted to talk to people and find out how do you hear about us? What, what channels are you listening to? Is it the... Um, 
Are you are you getting our new, uh, Snow Pro newsletter? Are you listening to us on Facebook or Instagram? Are you using our website? Is it the the uh, is it email blast that you're looking at? So one of the things that I discovered, and you'll see that in a second, is that it's all of the above. And so we need to make sure that we're getting our message out and communicating with you. As, as you can see in some of these different pictures that I captured on my tour, one of the things that was really important to me as I traveled around was to be sure that I connected with all the different disciplines within our organization. I sought to align with events that were being hosted at resorts. So it might have been a snowboard event or a tele event, or I tried to get an adaptive event at, at Wintergreen and unfortunately it was canceled, but I have connected with some of our adaptive instructors um, at Wintergreen, but also when I was up at Moon Mountain, we spent some time with them there. And so it was really important with, for me to be able to reach out to those different disciplines to make sure that we're, everything is equitable. We're treating everyone in the same way. Everyone is getting the same amount of value from their participation in the organization. I also wanted to talk to former members or people that were non-members. Why have they left the organization? Why aren't they interested in joining? To find out what it is we need to do to encourage them to participate. So basically, um, going out and meeting with all of these different groups to figure out what we can do to increase our value. And some of the key takeaways that I took from that process is obviously I heard that the cost is a factor. The dues, the events, particularly if you want to, if you let your certification lapse and you want to reinstate, that's a pretty pricey. Um, uh, pricey situation. So it's one of those things that we're trying to balance. In, in my opinion, when I look at the benefits that I get from the organization, I've been a 30 plus year member. And when I look at the pro deals that are offered, when I look at the educational resources, when I go to an event, and I've often gone to some of our bigger events as a Nash, at the National Academy or to get my tele certification or to go to an interski event and those pricey events, but to have the opportunity to ski or ride with amazing pros in our organization and take little bits away from them, to me has always been worth the value, but I'm not sure that that's true for everyone in our organization. So figuring out not necessarily how do we, how do we lower the cost because there's, there's only so much room there, but how do we increase the value? And one of the ways that we can do that is by increasing the clinician variety and then the events that we're offering out there. In the past couple of years, in order to keep costs down, we tended to keep the clinicians close to their home area. So that cut down on their travel expenses. The benefit of that is that it keeps our overall expenses associated with that event down and therefore keeps the event prices lower. But the disadvantage to you, the member, is that you might often see the same clinician over and over again. Not that they're bad, it's just we like to see different ideas. We like to hear different perspectives. Sometimes it's that one person who says something slightly differently that makes those light bulbs go off. The other thing too is that um, you might be, be skiing or riding with someone who works at your home hill that you could ski or ride with for free. So there's not a lot of incentive there for you to go to that extra clinic a year. So. One of the things I'd like to try to do is figure out how we can move the clinicians around the organization. Another thing that I heard when I was out there is the idea of allowing younger people to get registered and certified. As, as many of you know, right now in the Eastern Division, we have a, a limit of 16 years of age to get that certification. And, and I, prior to this job, I worked in a water park and I worked with a lot of 14 and 15 year olds. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that those 14 and 15 year olds are very astute. They're very capable. They're very mature. And, you know, that might not be true for every one of them, but there's a lot of them that are more than ready to tackle that certification process. And then the positive thing is they get to take another educational piece or maybe more move towards their level two before they head off to going to college. So they're more invested in their, their membership in the organization. Scholarships, dues, those things all go back to the cost of the organization. And so one of the things that I heard was 
that scholarship timing can be a little bit tricky. It's so early before people really start thinking about the season and what they're going to do. And, and also the idea of could we be offering scholarships for dues? So it's not just for those event fees. In order to be able to do that, we need to be raising more money for our education foundation, but that's something that we're gonna be focusing on and, and trying to do over the next couple of years so that we can support more members in their membership and event participation. One of the other challenges that we heard is about the adaptive certification. You know, in order to get certified with the adaptive credentials, there are six or seven different events you have to participate in. And oftentimes as an adaptive instructor, you're a volunteer. And so that becomes a very pricey proposition. So the adaptive steering committee right now is working on some ideas to see if there's ways that we can make it easier to accomplish. Lots of times those events get canceled because there's not enough participation, which further complicates it. So I just want you to know that we've heard the challenges there. We appreciate the effort that you're putting in and your volunteerism. And we wanna to try to figure out ways to support you to be successful in getting those higher levels of certification. Always an ongoing issue is the feedback on our assessment forms. If any of you have participated in assessments this year, you know that we have a new online form this form was designed by leadership from every discipline across this entire country. So this is not a form particular to us in the Eastern Division. It's being used everywhere across this country, which is fantastic. This is the first time that that has ever happened. And it's going to bring a lot of consistency and unification in our organization across the country. The challenge is there's a lot of criteria on there and our staff, as well as you, I'm sure are trying to get used to, all right, how do I show that I can do all of these different things? How do I show that I own the learning outcomes that these criteria are associated with? And our clinicians are also trying to figure out how, how can I help my participants to be successful in that assessment process? So I fully expect that as we get more accustomed to this new electronic process, we're going to be seeing better feedback, but I've also already talked to the discipline task force leaders here in this division, and we're planning summer activities to continue to work on our feedback writing skills. I mentioned that because of the diversity of our division, when I asked about how do you hear about us, how do you find out what's going on, it ran the full rampant. It went from word of mouth to the printed magazine to Facebook, to the website, and everything in between. And so we need to be on all of those channels. One of the things I did hear regularly is that people are looking for that event poster back. Now, we stopped doing it two years ago because of COVID. We weren't even sure what was going to be happening for events. Same thing for this year. The other reason we didn't do it this year was because, as you might have noticed, we are constantly adjusting that schedule. We're constantly adding exciting new opportunities for you. You know, get to ride with Tom Vickery or go out with uh, Nate Gardner or get to ski with Emily Lovett are all fantastic opportunities that we don't know about till kind of a couple of weeks before that event. So what I'm envisioning is still offering a poster for you, but maybe that poster is going to outline the development pathway that you wanna go through. Maybe it will highlight some of our premier events and some of the major assessment activities, but then just a reminder to be sure you're looking at the website for those clinics and educational opportunities that might constantly be changing. Speaking of that website, ours is horrible. I totally own that. It's not, a, I didn't build it, but I get that there's problems with it. And so this summer, another one of our projects is going to be revamping that to make sure that the information is accurate, it's easy to assess, and it helps you to service yourselves when you're, when you're trying to answer your own questions. And last thing I heard is not everyone is aware of all of the resources that are available to you as members. So for example, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is access to the digital manuals. Back when I joined the organization, you had to join the organization and then you had to buy your, your technical manual and then the children's manual. Now, when you join, you get access to the primary manual for your discipline, the technical manual. You also get access to the teaching snow sports manual. And brand new this year, 
you get access to the new Teaching Children Manual, which is a fantastic resource. So you get those all electronically. And if you haven't already, I encourage you to, to go to this website, follow the directions for the digital manual, download the app on your phone, and that will allow you to pull up these different resources, the 32 degrees, the manuals. There's a, there is an audio version of the Teaching Snow Sports Manual, if that works for you. I spend a lot of time in the car, so that helps me. I will warn you in advance, it's not really an audible audio version. And so it can be a little tricky to find your spot. So I recommend you plan ahead, and choose the chapters you want to listen to so you can listen to it start to finish. But that's a fantastic resource. You can use the find function on your phone. So if there's a piece of vocabulary, a word you don't know how, what it is, you can search for it, find it in that manual, open it up. And also all of the, um, not all, but many of those images are links to videos that you could play for your own benefit or even to share with a guest. So definitely be aware that that resource exists, that you get all three of those manuals. This website right here is the picture I'm showing only mentions two of them, but you definitely get all three of them. And so please be sure you check that out. The other thing to point out is this instructor toolkit that's listed here. And this provides you with some fantastic resources if you're not sure how to talk about your certification or what this organization is all about, or if you're looking for some resources like business cards or tip cards, or, or you need to do an interview for the media and looking for some guidelines of what to say, or, or you want to create some of your own materials and you're looking for the style guide, all of these resources are right here for you to be able to take advantage of as a member. So these both of these things are on the national website at www the snowpros.org under membership, and then there, there are links under there. So please be sure that you check both of those out. For those of you that are listening or who like the numbers, um, a couple of highlights to share with you. Um, as of the 11th of this month, our member numbers are 9,520, and we've had 4,090 event registration. So that might be people that already participated in an event, or it could be people that are registered for an event going later in the season. I expect both of those numbers to go up before we reach the end of the season. But the good news is we're tracking ahead of where we were last year. And compared to our 20-year average, we're looking pretty good. So I think the organization is in great shape. And, and I think these numbers are particularly exciting because I know when I talk to a lot of you out there, when I was on my listening tour, many resorts are at about 50% of their optimum staffing. And a lot of you are working really hard because you don't have those extra staff people around. So instead of going out and providing training or being able to supervise and help other people on the staff or getting that training that you're looking for, you're working day in and day out. And that makes it really hard to go, oh, yeah, I, I, I should do my PSIA things as well. And so the fact that our numbers are tracking well tells me that you guys are feeling value in our organization, are excited about it. Now that hopefully we're past the, the bad weather we had around Christmas time, we're past that big COVID surge, we're starting to see those numbers tick up higher. And we really look forward to seeing a lot of you at events going forward. Speaking of those events, also shared on this screen is some information about surveys. We have a brand new survey tool that we're using here. And what that allows us to do is uh, it, we can log in on a daily basis and see as people are submitting their surveys online, we can immediately see that information and track how particular clinicians are doing or how individual events are doing or, or what the overall vision is for how we are. And so as you can see in here, overall, we're using a net promoter score. If you don't know what that is, it basically says, if you give us a nine or a 10 on the scale, that you're saying that, hey, you would refer a friend to one of our events. You liked it. You're promoting us. If you gave us a six or below on that same scale, then, you know, you might have had an okay experience, but you're really not rushing out to tell your friends and family and everyone you know to come do this with us. So, so that affects us, our net promoter score negatively. And then the, those seven and eights, that really just has no impact. You're kind of just out there in the middle. And so if we look at this and you see that we have that net promoter score of 83 in here, we're doing pretty well there. In fact, I can say of the 100 and, um, 
uh, roughly 170 or so events that we've received surveys on, not necessarily events that we've done, but that we've received a survey on, over 100 of those, we got a score of 100, which is a perfect score. So I'm very excited that we're doing a good job out there. When we see one of these that doesn't look as good, when we see that negative 100 or any negative number, we can immediately look at that. We can contact the, the member or we can talk to the ed staff person and, and find out what's going on so that we make sure that we're addressing that information right away. So this is a really exciting new tool for us that's going to help us to increase our feedback, help us to do a better job for you. Next piece I wanted to talk about briefly is getting that message out. Um, like I said, we are on all those different channels. One of the best ways we get our message out is quite honestly, word of mouth. Somebody in your snow sports school is aware of an event going on or had a fantastic experience or saw something online and they share that and then they share that with someone else and so on and so on and so on. So please, if, you, if you're excited about something, please share that word out with other people in your school. If you are a social media user, there's a couple of different places you can look for information. There's definitely our Eastern Division Facebook page. We also have two private groups that are really sponsored by our Next Core, which is the, the advisory group that runs for, uh, that supports initiatives to help develop members in the 16 to 39 year old age group. Those are both private groups, but if you go on there, you can find it and request to be invited. We'd be more than happy to include you in there. I can tell you that monitoring those groups, they're great questions, great ideas um, that get shared in those groups. So I highly encourage you to check them out. I'm also, I'm trying to get better at Instagram because I've heard that Instagram is definitely one of the mediums that people are using. So while I was driving around on my tour, I had Instagram for dummies playing on the radio, trying to see if we can do a better job there. So it's, we're still not doing as good a job as we could on the Instagram platform, but we hope to get better. We also try to do targeted email. So if we know that there's an event in your particular community, in your discipline, we try to reach out to you directly through an email to let you know that that's going on. So please be sure you're looking out for those. If you don't feel like you're getting any emails from us, because we do send out quite a few, please reach out to our office and let us know. We can check your member profile, make sure that we've got the correct email address in there for you. Also, we just published the latest issue of our Snow Pro newsletter. This particular issue is a digital issue. We've done that to keep the overall costs down. But the other advantage of it is this issue is jam packed with great pictures from our Pro Jam and Masters Academy events, from my listening tour, other information in there. And so it looks really beautiful when you access it digitally so you can see the full color of all those images. There's some great articles there in this issue. So please be sure you check them out. And then the last thing is, you know, one of the ways you hear from us is through our website. There is definitely information there. You can get to the event schedule there. We're gonna be working to make that all better. Now, one of the things that I'm really excited to share with you, if you came to our Pro Jam event, you might've had the opportunity to ski with or, or talk with the photographer that we brought along. We wanted to have better images that represent our organization. And also the next core wanted to put together a video for you that was going to help to share the excitement and energy and passion that we all feel about our organization to help encourage more members to join. So I'm very excited to unveil this video to you. This is the first time it's being seen in public. We're going to be sending um, links out. It will be available on, on the social media platforms. We're sending links out to your snow sports directors, to all the participants who were at ProJam, we're gonna be sending it out to the area reps. So you should be able to get this, share it, use it, share it with your friends, share it with other instructors, help to use this piece to get them as excited about the organization as we are. So let, let me cue this up and hopefully it's gonna run for us. Every time I come back here, meet new friends, ski at different mountains, I'm enjoying the Pro Jam event here at Killington. It's an absolute blast. So we all love to be out here right out the snow in the winter and we just like to play but a lot about what we do is is about connecting with people and connecting people to our sport it's more than just about skiing you get all bundled up and come outside and exercise all winter 
you make the best friends. Uh, you get another family. I've made my best friends through this organization. I've made friends all over the East, and it's just something that I've never experienced in anything else I've ever been a part of. I love this organization. It provides an opportunity for us to share the knowledge that we have with the rest of the world. So come join the fun. Start teaching, share the love, join the organization. The more you put into it, the more you'll get out of it. Just be part of this because it's really special. Awesome. I hope that that played all right for all of you out there. Um, I really think that it's well done. If it didn't play that well, we'll get you the link to it and you can check it out. It's uh, published on YouTube. I had it set up to go public at 7.15. So if you search for it, you'll probably find it at this point. So um, like I said, we're really excited about this piece. Hopefully it made you as excited about being part of this organization and you can see how it will inspire other people to join. What the, for the rest of our agenda here, um, what we've got going on is I'd like to open the floor at this point in time for questions and answers. And then when the question and answer piece is done, we have a zone one election going on this season. And zone one is our main New Hampshire and Vermont members. And so we have a handful of candidates that are on this call with us, and we're going to give them three minutes of time to kind of make their case for why you would want to vote for them if you're able to vote in the main New Hampshire or Vermont zone. And so if, if at that point in time, you're not interested in that election, you're welcome to drop off the call. We won't be, able, we won't be doing anything beyond that last bit. So before we get to that, I wanna just go through uh, questions and answers. I'm gonna unshare my screen here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put it out there to uh, Karen or Don. Did anyone put any questions in the chat section while I was doing my little presentation there that we need to cover? Someone has asked Tom um, if we'll if they'll have access to the slides. Um, we I could definitely make those slides available. Yep. Um, Karen, you'll have to help me figure out how to make those slides available, or not necessarily how to, but where we'll put them so people can access them. Um, and we'll, you know, we did not require you to register for this particular event. We wanted to be sure it was open and easy for anyone who wanted to participate to jump on the call. So we don't necessarily have a list of the participants that we could email it to. So um, we'll, we'll come up with a way to, to get those slides together and get them out to you. We have any other any other questions? You're welcome to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Someone else asked about the percentage of members who are level one, two, and three. And I don't have those numbers at my fingertips, but I can come up with them. I don't have, I, don't, I apologize. I don't have the specific breakdown form uh, for you of, of the different levels of certification. I can tell you things like 30% of our membership are female. I can tell you 82.4% are certified of some level. Um, I can also tell you that within that, 28% are in the 60 to 69 uh, age bracket, 17, 18% are in the 50 to 59 age bracket, 12% are in the 20 um, to 31 age bracket. So, um, I, we still see that our, the majority of our membership is in that older age bracket. John Morris. Yes, sir. How are you? Great. Good. Uh, just a few recommendations. Uh, a lot of the ski schools, especially in the Vermont area, New York area, tend to, to uh, get most of their teachers from their local area. It might not be a bad idea to get the like the if if you had like a, a high school students like their junior senior year get a special deal where they can learn to be a ski instructor program have like a little mm -hmm. learn to be a ski instructor program where you'd be able to get them interested in that and it would be free that would be tied in with the, with the, with the ski school and the mountain itself because that's the way you might be able to cultivate some new instructors that way because they're local, they can get there no matter what the weather is, and they would be able to ski free, and they'd be able to learn how to ski better. So there would be a lot, whole lot of benefits for them, but you need to be able to bring them in 
whether you need to do that under their, your scholarship program or, or whatever. Now, I'm, I'm a 42-year member. I'm old, and as they say, I'm aging out. Also, I got the, the latest newsletter. I looked at that, the one online. It was disconcerting that it was only one article on Alpine, and that was about a gentleman who wrote about looking down at your skis when you're turning, which was, I'm not, I'm not even going to go into that. What, what my suggestion is, we have demo team members, and every month, if one demo team member would write an article on ski teaching that would be wonderful it wouldn't be putting a lot of pressure on them and uh it's just a recommendation also uh to have um the uh demo team do a, a video this is how you teach a beginner lesson and this is why we do it this way the next one is this is an intermediate lesson we're we're we're, we're going to teach this intermediate lesson. this person is rotating and this is how we're going to help him stop rotating yeah you know, just a short video it could be youtube where you can just send all the members a link, especially the level ones and the potential members who want to become level ones. And that would give them some, you could amp it up. This is how you ski bumps. Uh, it would be very interesting. It would be, rather than, when you look at the newsletter, there's a lot of, we're doing this, we're doing that structurally. A, a lot of people don't have, don't have much interest in that. They, they want to learn how to teach better, ski better. That's my, that's my opinion. Uh, I, you know, I could be wrong, and I've been wrong before. <laughs> and thank you for listening. John, thank you very much for those, those different ideas. Um, and so to some of those points, I definitely encourage you to go to our national website to check some of the th resources that are out there. One of the things that we do is we do have a junior instructor program. It's a certificate program. It's really, really well laid out. It has e-learning pieces. It has pieces that you need to take care of um, on slope with a, with a certified instructor that you're going through. When they're all done this program, they get a certificate. I can tell you that some resorts are doing this um, as part of their junior seasonal program to encourage some of those participants to move into staff when they get a little bit older. Other people are looking at doing this even at a younger uh, age to get people excited about moving into an instructor role when they get a little bit older. So definitely want to check out those that junior instructor certificate program if that's something of interest to you. Um, and I, I do understand your point about you know bringing those local schools together. Definitely think that the resorts are doing that. They're finding ways to bring those people in, but maybe that is something that we should be supporting as well as part of our, our organization. If this was all working, we wouldn't have this problem that we're talking about right now. If it's there, let's get working, uh, you know, for, for the survival of the organization. I will Thanks. also, I will also I... tell you that um, out on this website, there's the beginner's guide to cross-country skiing, snowboarding. There's also uh, programs here in terms of teaching those beginner lessons that have all been done by the national team to um, help you understand how to teach those beginner lessons. I highly recommend those programs. You get a certificate suitable for framing when you're done those. They are awesome programs. Um, and so be sure to check those out. You know, in terms of the Snow Pro News, our Snow Pro newsletter, the national team is really writing those articles for the 32 degree magazine that you definitely get um, yeah. as part of your membership. And, and we really like to keep the, those articles there. That's a great resource. It's, they're beautifully done. It's a beautiful color magazine. Our, our regional newsletter is really more that. It's a newsletter. It's an opportunity for local members to, to share their ideas. It's a place for us to get information out to you. And we do occasionally have some, some good articles in there, but I definitely recommend you look toward that 32 degrees for more of the, the really in-depth articles that you're looking for from the national team. I understand. I'm not looking for them. I'm a level three. I've taught for 43 years. I, you know, I'm up to date. My, my certification is still up to date. I was talking to help all the beginners, you know, the level ones, the level twos, the level threes to make them get better. I, I'll be, I'll be 76 years old in April for me. You know, I, I, what do I have? I have a couple of more years to pay dues and I'll be gone. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, we so. hope not, John. <laughs> but we do, we do appreciate those suggestions. And hopefully the people who are looking for those resources 
can look to the national site or and or we will definitely consider what we can do there. And, and it, can it, I might, just jump in for a second, Kathy? Because um, I don't know how to press any button. First of all, I just want to ask, is that John Morris from Snow House? That's correct. <laughs> so you fitted some boots for me many times. But he, the, I was a former <laughs> high school principal. And this idea that John has a very good idea, the way to reach out is to send representation or get it a table at one of the educational um, conferences, either for principals or phys ed directors, um, because we'd love schools would love to have that kind of internship or externship. I, I will tell you that one of the things I was very excited to see when I was traveling down at Catalucci is they have a great partnership down there with, um, I, I want to say it's Appalachian State or another organization, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but the, all of their outdoor recreation instructors are all going through the certification process as, as part of their outdoor education piece. And, and I think that's a great model. And I think, I think we are doing that in other places, but that's a place that we can continue to do outreach and, and bring even more people in through that, that route. I do see um, someone's had their hand up for a while. I don't know if it is. It, there's no picture and it just says iPad, but I don't it's know. If, my awesome. name's Jerry. Um, congratulations on your uh, position. Thank you. I've taken some clinics with you. I've been around since 75. I got, I got a few questions. Number one, when uh, Ray Allard and uh, Mike Mendrick were in, we never received any kind of financial report or never had an audit. Why is that? I know we're a not for profit organization, but I've never seen in the time that I've been a member any kind of accountability for um, our financial situation. Why is that? I, I can't speak for what they did or why they did it. Um, I can tell you that I do report. In fact, I just had a board meeting last night where I shared financial information. As a 5013C, that information is readily accessible if you were to look it up. We are required by the state of New York and just by our own good practices to get audited every year. So uh, we do have audited financial statements. And I can, um, I, I don't know exactly why we're not um, publishing the financial records more beyond that. I would have to do a little bit more research to find out if there's something more beyond what we're already doing. Okay, thank you. I'll look that up. Also, um, in one of the uh, things that I read, if a member can't uh, attend an event because of a, uh, an injury or some sort of a health issue, why would they have to do a HIPAA, you know, HIPAA loss kind of protect you? Why wouldn't they just be able to call the office and say, hey, listen, I have this kind of condition. I can't attend an event this year. Why does it have to be the doctor's um, authorization with that information uh, historically that's the way we've, we've <laughs> done it and i'll have to do some research to figure out if that's something that we need to continue to do we also do offer lots okay. of online um, another now. so uh so people even with injuries who can't be on snow can take advantage of the online options so keep keep that in mind as well i understand that um, i was just wondering about somebody that couldn't attend and needed an excuse um also um we're talking about costs here. I've been a director, technical director for more years than I want to really talk about, but it's really difficult when you have a small area that doesn't do a lot of lessons and you have, you know, if you're going to go on a certification path and you have to do your digits and your updates and your, all your prereqs and then your exams, there's no way that, the, that an individual, a younger person can afford that. Um, now, if you're at Killington, or if you're at Mont Snow, or if you're at Hunter, um, if you're at a big area, but, you know, I'm, I'm from Western Pennsylvania, and a lot of our areas have very, very little lessons. So, you know, if you teach it at, say, Laurel Mountain or Hidden Valley, you may not make enough lessons to even compensate for, for the dues and the, uh, and the events that you must attend. There, there should be some way to mitigate um, those costs for the new person. And uh, to the other gentleman there, um, when I was at um, an area here in Western Pennsylvania, we used to go to the high schools, we used to go to the Boy Scouts, we used to go to the Girl Scouts, and we never had an issue 
uh, when I was at, when I was at Seven Springs, we had 300 instructors. So we never had an issue with uh, uh, motivating and inspiring people to come and teach. So uh, those are my uh, those are some of the things. I really appreciate the Zoom meeting. I think it's very very valuable, and I appreciate your efforts. And I uh, thank you for uh, listening to my uh, information and my diatribe. Can I just add something about about that cost? So I have teenagers who have got and their level ones. Um, actually, I have one that's older now, but it used to be when the kids are in high school or college, there was a reduced price on their membership. And they didn't have to do their updates every two years. It was every four years, which to me was reasonable because obviously we as parents are going to be putting out that money. But for them to pay the full cost and have to do their updates every two years is getting fairly expensive. And it's very hard if they want to stay within the skiing industry, they're going to college, trying to get their degree, but then later on down the road, they're it, still teaching and then know, they want to maybe move on to a level two. In these four years, or how long it is, if they get it at 16, which one of my sons did, it gets very expensive. After he got this level one, all the benefits were taken away for any of the I'm, college or high school kids. I probably would have double thought of him taking this level one. I'm not sure. Is anyone else you having know, trouble so with the audio? It's here? starting to get really expensive. Yeah. Whomever is speaking, Go um, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut in just because your audio is is really not coming through well. Um, and so we we hear the concern. The concern is you've got co uh, high school, college age students. The dues and the re-up commitments have changed over the years. That's kind of before my time. I do understand what you're saying there. I don't know if Karen or Don or Pete Howard, somebody wants to speak to that. It, it's my understanding, and I, I could be mistaken here, that you know, as, a, as a professional organization, we're trying to make the requirements as a professional within this organization consistent. And I do understand that people are at different stages in their lives and whatnot, but it's more about the, the certification as a professional uh, uh, identity than about where your stage is in life. But like I said, Karen, Don, you got something to add there? I, I don't remember exactly um, the reasons behind it, but at one point, not too many years ago, um, uh, it was determined, um, it, you know, with one of the board meetings and Michael Mandrick that um, we should be charging the same amount for everyone for the dues. So if they're if they're in a uh, full membership type situation as opposed to like a, an alumni or something so um i'd be happy you know if you want to email me i can look up those records and um and get back to you a lot of that came about because of the quarterly auto pay program right there was a lot of complicated programming that went into it and so uh it was easier for the programmers to handle uh, dues that were consistent across the board. And just real quickly, and, uh, Catherine was on the board at that point, Catherine McLaughlin. So Catherine, I want to jump in. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and say part of the decision to to take away the tiered dues system was to st statistically, we saw very little impact. It didn't actually increase our retention of those members and it increased our complication to execute billing and ed credits. So we gave it four years, I think, three or four years, and it had no statistical impact on retention or dues. So 
Um, definitely, we I've heard this comment when I'm out on the road. Um, as I started off this session by saying it, it may not be something we can take care of right now. It may take a while, but we will definitely look into this further to see if there's ways that we can continue to make this organization viable, no matter what age bracket you're in. Every, everybody has something. And if you're younger, you're off to school. If you're in your 30s, you got the young family. If you're later years, you're retired. So there's there's something for everybody. Uh, but trying to figure out how we can embrace and engage and make this organization something that works for you is important to me. And so we'll we'll continue to look at it. Hey, Kathy, um, I, see, I'm, I see a couple of folks have their hand up, um, but we also had some questions in the chat box that uh, came in a while back. So maybe Karen will read a couple of those. Francesca Drake um, asked uh, what we're doing uh, to address the indifference towards membership and certification from young up and coming instructors who don't feel the need for our validation when their mountain provides little to no certification incentives and the high cost of memberships and events and exams. Is, I'm, I'm not sure if it's about, are we trying to change it so that they don't have indifference or are we trying to change it so that the schools that they're working for care more about it? I, I can tell you a couple of things that we're doing. We saw the video earlier tonight that we're trying to show people of all ages that are excited about being part of this organization and have value. We are doing, um, the directors within our division have been notified about a futures camp that we're doing, which is intended, to, it's a, a free program for people who are up and coming, um, get a chance, if, they're, if they've got ed staff visions in their future, we see them as future leaders, they're being nominated to participate in this event. Um, only 12 people are gonna get selected from the East Coast to participate in that. But that's one of the ways that we're trying to inspire our future leaders. Not sure that that answered your question, but I'm not sure I understood the question well either. Maybe you could try it one more time. Yeah, and so just, just like uh, to give you an example, our, uh, I had a conversation with our general manager. Part of, part of that was the fact that like, it's not at all financially incentivized to get a certification. Um, and I just like, it seems like the mountain doesn't care. And uh, that's, that's like, it's weird that we're saying that being a member of PSIA is important and valuable for becoming a ski instructor and stuff when it's, when like the mountain itself doesn't really care to have certified instructors. Like I don't, it seems like there's a disconnect there. I, I, I understand your question there. So you, you are correct. There are definitely some mountains um, in the country, in our division, that um, find no value in certification. Uh, there are other mountains in our division that really value it, um, that pay people's dues, that pay them to go to events, that give regular scholarships. And, and so one of the things that I'm trying to do as part of my outreach is I'm trying to talk to GMs and owners um, about the what we're doing as an organization. And as you might have seen in the last couple of years, the promotion of the teaching and people skills. One of the things that we know from the directors and the resort owners that they don't really care about our skiing and riding skills. What they care about is our ability to connect with their guest. And that all comes from those teaching and people skills. And so now as an organization, as we're able to focus on those, we're able to provide feedback, we're able to provide our performance guides that give you ideas on how to be better in those areas. We create more of a connection with the guest. The guest wants to come back to the hill. Now we are, are, seem more valuable um, out on the hill to the resort operators and owners. So Hopefully, as that message gets out there, I can tell you a couple of the different, I spoke with the president at Killington, I spoke with the owner at Obergatlinburg, I spoke with the GM at WISP and, and others. Um, they recognize the value of these teaching and people skills. And so I think as they start to spread that word throughout their community, maybe we will see uh, more resorts, maybe like yours, that are deciding it's valuable. Um, how about if we take a couple of these hands up? I see John S. You've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kathy, first of all, I'm John Schwantes, uh out of North Carolina. 
Um, uh, been certified for 52 years and many of them with Don at Creek Peak and then up at uh, Dry Hill in Watertown, New York. And now I'm down here in North Carolina teaching at Appalachian uh, Ski Mountain. Awesome. I just want to input that there is a huge market down here. The, the crowds that come up from the southern states, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, et cetera, are enormous. So I know you guys work with Beach Mountain a lot, and you met, mentioned Catalucci out west of uh, Asheville. But I encourage you to, when you do come south, to embrace all the areas, Sugar, Appalachian, and Beach, because there's a lot of crowds coming in to get taught, and there's a lot of instructors that uh, I am the only level three at my area and uh, there's one other level two couple level one so encourage you to focus on marketing to our area thank you awesome thank you John how about Alan Miller you've also had your hand up for a while yeah thank you Kathy um, I am a, an adaptive instructor at Double H Ranch in Lake Luzerne New York which is 100 percent unpaid uncompensated strictly volunteer and I just like to add my voice to the recommendation that PSIA really look hard at how the, the, the dues system and the continuing ed system uh, applies to people who do this strictly for volunteer without any compensation to make up for the costs that we're incurring in the process. Now, I will say that in achieving my adaptive certifications, you know, all of the time and all of the money that I have spent has totally been worth it. I have worked with fantastic instructors who have taught me things I thought I could never learn. Uh, but at the same time, I know that there is at least maybe enough of a population within PSIA that have the same situation as I do, where the costs just keep building up and it becomes very difficult to continue as a certified instructor and not just say, well, I've learned all this, I really don't need to learn anymore. Now, I don't really believe that, but there needs to be a balance point. So more of a comment than a question. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Alan. We do appreciate all of our adaptive instructors out there that are volunteering to create these amazing experiences for their guests. We know that when an adaptive athlete comes to a resort, they bring a, a village with them, and that helps all of us. And so it's an important part of our market that we, we want to be sure we're recognizing and taking care of. So thank you. Um, David Chapman, I saw your hand up. Yeah, hi. How are you doing? Well, thanks. Um, I don't know. How am I doing? I was, uh, <laughs> you're doing well. I'm doing well too. Thank you. Good. Um, I, I, served on, I served on the board back in the late 70s. You know, I've been, I was originally certified in 1974. I did run a ski school for seven years. The issue, and, and you know, I guess it's incumbent on me to say a lot of these questions are the same questions that we were dealing with 40 years ago. They, they haven't really changed. Um, we who have been certified for a long time know that we see a value in it. And I think that if you if you teach full-time, um, even just a, as a seasonal job, paying the dues is not the issue. But in talking to other instructors, and most of us come from ski schools where we may have 10% of the instructors are certified and 50% of members and in talking to the other, the other instructors who are not, we know that we can give them some intangible reasons why we think there's value in being a member. Um, and, and that could go on all night. But I remember trying to justify to the management of the ski area why I would pay a certified instructor more than a non-certified instructor. And, and really all they cared about was that I have, and I hate to use the term warm body, because they, they did recognize that the instructors were more than just warm bodies, but we had to have enough instructors. We, we had a very big, and still do, uh, this is a Pat Speak in New Hampshire, probably 8,000 kids a week in the programs. So we had to have, getting the students was not the issue. Getting the instructors wasn't at the time because we had a lot of college students and high school students. It has gotten more difficult. 
Um, but but the, without going in that direction, I think that one of the things that I've always felt that the organization could do, and I know that we've, we've re redefined ourselves many times, and we're still an educational organization and education for the membership, and hopefully, hoping that the membership will then uh, improve the, the sport of skiing. But what the managers and the owners really want to know is, are we, are we creating any retention? If somebody takes a lesson with me, will they come back next week? Can I prove that? Uh, and can we prove it statistically? If people take lessons, are they less likely to be injured? I think that you know possibly if we work with the National Ski Patrol, there may be statistics buried away somewhere where we could bring them out and, and say this, there is a benefit to a certified instructor. What else can we prove that we do for the sport well, it, it really comes down to can we prove that we make more money for the ski area? And, and really all they care about is retention. Are we, are we tracking that at all? Do we have any way of telling whether people who take lessons are more likely to continue in the sport uh, or not? And, and that, I, I know, I know you, you may, I'm not sure that that, <clears throat> that was a question that I asked years ago. And I, I was still advocating for some kind of a study where we could, and, and it may have to begin this season and, you know, looking toward the future, but can we prove to the ski industry that we are, we are of value? And can we prove that we're of more value if we, if we become certified? We talk to ourselves a lot and we know that it's true, but can we prove it to anybody else? Excellent, David. I'm definitely, done. definitely something to look into. Um, I know that there are systems out there uh, for that are helping people to track the performance of their individual instructors among their group lesson. How that connects from lesson to lesson, and if that guest is coming back over time, I don't know if that data exists, but certainly something to look into. I can tell you that one of the um, uh, snow sports directors that I talked to while I was on my listening tour very definitely did an analysis of um, accidents, incidences that he had at his hill. And he felt as though he could prove statistically that when guests went with a certified instructor, that they were, it was a safer experience. That was his opinion. I didn't see the data. I, I can't speak to it, but I will tell you that individual snow sports directors have, have tried to make, go through that effort and to try to make that case. So, um, Stu, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, hi. My name is Stu Hockman. I learned to ski when I was 40. My son embarrassed me to learn to ski. And then Robin Kalitri convinced me to become an instructor. And John Morris convinced me to wear the Del Ballo boots, which I'm still wearing today. I've been instruct I had been instructing at Mountain Creek for almost 20 years uh, before I retired. And my biggest problem there is I just feel that instructors get no real incentive from the mountain that we're online, you don't get paid unless you're in a lesson. We get paid less than everybody else. Our locker room is on the other side of the mountain and uh, we just don't have an incentive. And I think that's a big problem that we're the only people working at the mountain that actually contribute more profit to the mountain than anybody else working at the mountain. We get a jacket, we have to buy our own skis, our own pants, our own boots, our own gloves, our own goggles, our own helmets. and we earn practically nothing. So I don't see the incentive for people to become instructors, to become certified. They, they don't get anything out of it. And that to me is the biggest problem. And again, I'm only talking about Mountain Creek. I don't know how it is at other mountains, but at Mountain Creek, you know, the, we were just there to provide a, a service that the mountain wanted without getting true compensation. Thank you, Stu, for your comments there. I think you can prob you're can you probably reflecting the comments of, of many people that are sitting on this panel. I think one of the things that helps me to do my job is that I can relate to that as, as a 30-year-old, a 30-year member, not 30 years old, I wish, <laughs> could go back in time to that. But as a 30-year member, I've been a part-timer as well as a full-timer in the industry. I've been on the ed staff. And so I have the perspective of being able to see this industry from a lot of different points of view. And, and so, you know, I definitely understand your point of view there. It is our mission for our organization to create those educational experiences, to help create, um, you know, a sense of belonging to, to create professional development as a member of the snow sports industry. 
In my vision, I talked about wanting our industry partners to understand and value our education and certification programs. That's going to take time, um, but I hope that over the long term, as they value our ability to use our teaching and people skills and to connect with that guest and to hopefully show that we are retaining them and converting them, that we will increase the value to the resort operators and then Maybe that will change the way that we're compensated, but that's a long run in there. I'm not. I'm not tackling it at, at least at this point in time at, at, from the the head-on point of view. I'm going to try to demonstrate our value um, through the programs we offer. So you mentioned Robin Kalitri, and and so Robin, I see he also has his hand raised here, and so. Hey, Kathy, Thank you, Kathy. So at Gunstock, we do a few things. First of all. Uh, Peter Weber, our uh, director of snow sports, makes sure that everybody knows and hears about PSIA. Whenever there's any opportunity, we do training, uh, whether we're on the book or not on the book. We uh, pay for people's exams if they pass the year after if they come back. Uh, we also have a local scholarship program for some of the youngsters who can't afford to go. But I can tell you that Stu uh, Hopper and I did some trips out west. And when we walked up to a board to buy a lift ticket at a western resort, and on the board it said a special price for PSIA, that was a hit. And that's something that we should be able to do in the east. Because whether they value us in putting us out to teach, they should value the fact that PSIA does have a service. And I would say send out a hard-nosed negotiator with some of the mountains. So instead of worrying about this reciprocal letter stuff, you get a guarantee of a discount, symbolic or not, for your lift ticket price at any mountains of the east. And that should be doable in the short term. Um, and you Kathy, you're your... doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. I saw Thank Pete you. Howard had his hand up. I'm yeah. going to ask him to to chime in here for a minute. Uh, to Pete Howard, our chairman of our board, everybody, if you don't know. Hi folks, uh, how are you tonight? It's great to listen to all your thoughts. Um, I just wanted to share uh, one thought that actually we have two forms of membership. Uh, one is the individual member and the other is the member schools. And approximately, oh, three or four years ago, we, we really started to try to get more schools to become basically members of our organization. And we now have over a hundred member schools in the East. And um, by providing services to them that we hope in time are gonna become indispensable, uh, there will be greater recognition of uh, the individual members who happen to be part of these schools. Uh, I would also say that you know, I, I've been certification chair for quite a long time and involved in the organization for a long time. And one of the things that we look at as an organization is there are things that we have very direct control of, things like our events, some of the certification processes, et cetera. And then there are things that we have influence on. So we can influence to a degree, you know, the relationship between the organization and the schools in the East. And then there's some things that we, we have no control over. And that's just the business environment that we work in. And um, all of us as people make choices in our life about what we're gonna spend money on and what we're gonna do with our lives. And, and that's just the way that it is. And I guess what I'm saying is your organization is doing the best it can to create a relationship with the schools and become indispensable to better help each individual member. Thanks. Thank you, Peter Howard, well said. Um, hey, gang, I, I wanna be sure I'm respectful of everybody's time. I wanna be sure we get to those uh, zone one candidate uh, comments. So we're just gonna take a few more questions and, and then we're gonna move on to hearing from those folks um, Don, uh, did you mention earlier, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I was just going to point out that Pete wanted to talk. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we I have a question from, from James Hackett. I eventually saw Pete waving as one of the little tiny boxes on my screen. I'm excited about how many participants we have here. It looks like we got about 157 <clears throat> people. So thanks. James Hackett, you want to chime in here? 
Yeah, you can call me Jim. I'm I'm down there at uh, Catalucci, and we were very pleased to have you come down because we don't get that much attention. But I come from an industry, automotive, where unions played a huge role, both positive and negative in our industry. We saw a lot of evolution. I would imagine if I was the owner of a major ski resort and I saw an organization like PSIA, I might be a little bit worried that they might start organizing to help themselves possibly at the cost of my own organization. How do we deal with that kind of an image? And is it a concern or has it been a concern over the years? Jim, and people who have been involved in this um, longer than I have can speak to this. Um, it has definitely come up in conversation. Uh, we, we continue to go back to it is our mission to support education. And, and that's the mission that I, at least at this moment in time, that's the mission that I'm trying to drive forward. Um, I don't know if Don, Pete, or anyone else has another response to that. It's definitely something that has been discussed, but not a path we're going to head down at this moment. Yeah, I don't, don't have anything other than what you're saying, Kath. I mean, I, I know the question comes up um, on occasion, and, you know, the, uh, I, I believe, and Kathy actually wrote, our, uh, Catherine McLaughlin wrote a little blurb on the, in the chat about this, but we would have to change um, a lot of things on our mission and, um, and probably reorganize, I think, Catherine, if we were going to go down that road to um, become advocates for the instructors. Don, it's Ty here. You know, uh, I'm also a board member, mm -hmm. uh, so we cannot go down that road yet by any means. <clears throat> We're a nonprofit organization. We're not designed for that. We're designed as an educational foundation. And, you know, that's we cannot become we cannot even advocate a union really in, when it comes down to it. You know, and it, it's, you know, it's probably a sad fact, but we can't. Yeah, and that's you know, it, there's there's been many discussions on this, and we just cannot go this direction at this point. Yeah, there was um, we we talked about that back in the good old days too, and the identity as an educational nonprofit was strengthened when it was recognized that if there was any advocacy at all, we might start looking at, at like a union. And because the ski areas didn't really have any trouble attracting instructors, they could just as easily kick PSAA out. So th that's been avoided. I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't advocate for things like better pay, but we don't do it as a union. We, we, we prove the value of certification and then work through the ski school director to work through their management. But I think that the minute we look like a union, we may not be represented at a lot of the ski areas. And I, you know, I honestly am brand new in this job. I've got plenty of things to tackle in terms of moving our mission forward. I'm ex really excited about the, the things that are coming from national. I'm excited about the new national standard, the unified assessment form, the performance guides that support that. And so I, I'm excited to keep promoting the, the positive things that are going on. I realize we can't, we can't ignore the challenges that we're all facing at our home hills. Um, but we also want to make sure we're doing the right job as an organization to do the best at what our mission is. So, um, Jim McHale, James McHale, I saw your hand go up, and then I think we're, we might move on. So, thank you, Kat, and congratulations on your appointment and the great work you're doing. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to work at Spring Mountain in Pennsylvania, and I want to add the encouraging note that we get great support from the owners, uh, and our director is very supportive. And we've been doing a lot of virtual training to make it cheaper and easier for a lot of our instructors, supplementing what's available with the e-learning through the National PSI site. So if anyone's interested in how to train instructors using virtual tools, uh, get a hold of me, uh, Jim McHale, James McHale, whatever you want to call me, I'll answer. You know, folks, I'm, I'm going to move on at this point. Thank you very much for all those comments and feedback. And please know that we, we've heard them. We've understood them. It's things that I've heard when I'm out on the road. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, there's things that we can tackle right away. There's things that are going to take a little bit longer. And there's things that go beyond even that. And so thank you for sharing those ideas. 
And let's just keep working together to promote the value, to do the best job we can out there for our guests. That's going to create a positive experience for them, get them coming back to the Hill. And, um, and I mean, that's our favorite part of our job, right? So let's, let's be our best out there. Um, so for folks, uh, we, as I mentioned at the beginning, we do have an election happening in zone one. Oh, and I'll just say, if you do have other concerns that I didn't get to, feel free to reach out to me at the office. We could talk separately, be happy to, to try to do that for you. So um, we do have these zone one candidates that I wanna give them an opportunity to speak. Um, I, I mentioned to those candidates that I was gonna do a drawing to see who would go first um, out of respect to one of those candidates who needs to dash quickly. I am going to allow them to go so that they can get off the line um, and then we'll we'll get the rest of the candidates going. So um, as far as I know, two of the zone one candidates are not present. Uh, I just wanna confirm that. If Chris Saylor or Richard Pierce is on the line and wanted to speak. Could you please let me know? Okay, so apparently they were they were busy and and weren't able to make it tonight. So um, we're uh, so uh, Joe. Um, I, I guess you need to you need to take off or something. So we're gonna we're gonna let you go first before the our other candidates. So thank you, Kathy. I, I appreciate it. My wife works nights, and I have. Uh dad duties here starting in about uh, 10 minutes. So um, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, my name is Joe Savage. I'm a certified instructor at Crotchet Mountain. I've been uh, with the PSAA now for uh, 12 seasons. Um, I, a number of people ask me, why do you want to do this? And I'm sort of one of those people that when in an assessment, I raise my hand to go first and I see a piece and it's like, okay, let's try that. Um, I've been doing board work uh, off and on since my early 20s uh, when I was on a uh, board of Fishburg Baby Baseball. And uh, I've always enjoyed being a part of these organizations and trying to influence change. And so while there may be other aspects to do it, when I saw the opportunity, I said, why not give it a shot? Um, it's something that uh, this organization is something I'm extremely passionate about and want to be a part of uh, and help influence uh, the direction. The part of the uh, plea that really spoke to me was about the uh, marketing uh, needs. Uh, in my day job, I'm the director of marketing operations at a digital agency. And so my experience uh, in marketing, especially with new media and uh, ways of reaching people, especially uh, attribution and uh, you know, understanding the value that those dollars are going out and bringing back to an organization is something that I specialize in. Um, and so when an organization says that they're looking for marketing help, uh, especially websites, uh, we our agency designs and builds websites. Um, I sort of felt compelled to sort of raise my hand, say hello, and throw my hat in the ring. Uh, there are a lot of uh, extraordinarily qualified uh, individuals that have come out uh, for this position, and I'm sure any one of us uh, would do a great job here, um, but I'm here to advocate for me. And so I would like uh, this opportunity to help influence that next uh, phase of our organization to work with Kathy and the other senior leadership here um, to help move PSI forward, to continue that mission of education, which is why I'm here. Um, I drive a great value and have learned so much from the organization, from my trainers at uh, various mountains, Pat's Peak, uh, Crotchet, Loon, uh, Ski Ward. I've worked at Big Hills, Little Hills, and um, I'm just really excited to be part of the organization and having the opportunity to uh, potentially work uh, close with the senior leadership and to uh, move the organization forward. And hopefully I'm under my three minutes because everyone's been on and very patient. And so I appreciate the opportunity to get in front of everyone and um, look forward to, to what happens next. Awesome. Thank you very much, Joe, for taking that moment. And thank you to the other candidates for letting me let Joe go first so that he could hop out and take care of the take care of the family. So um, so I have a very sophisticated way of determining who goes next. And so our remaining names are in the hat here. And the name that came up here is Tara, Tara Adams. Are you still on the line? I saw you earlier. Hi, Kathy. Yeah, I am. Hi, Tara. Um, thanks, everybody, for giving us the opportunity to, to talk for a couple of minutes and to introduce ourselves. Um, again, my name is Tara Adams. I'm the program director for the Adaptive Sports at Mount Snow. I'm also a trainer at Mount Snow, uh, Snow Sports School. And... Um, I'm, I have Aussie level two and adaptive level two, both snowboard, alpine, um, CS2, and FS1, Tele1 as well. 
one of the reasons why I decided to be part of this board is um, I love the community that we have, not just here, but as a national organization, as a whole professional organization between PSIA and Ozzy. And I was excited to be able to serve the membership. Um, I think that the biggest um, benefit that the membership or that the organization offers is the membership and the community that we have. Um, and I think that that needs to be accessible to everybody, not just, um, you know, the people that work full time, not just the people that work at big resorts, but really to everybody, not just the people that grew up, um, skiing and riding. I did not grow up in a sort of sports family. I started in my twenties and I just found a home here and I want, you know, to share that with everybody. And I think that a big part of that is we need to make this accessible for culture um, as a culture of an organization, that that is a big part of inviting people in. Uh, we need to make it accessible to, in value. So not just the cost of dues, but our cost, um, cost of the value ratio, like whatever I pay in, I'm actually getting something out. Um, and the education, I think that we need to make education accessible and relevant to everybody. And I think that that is a big part of why I've gone and, and certified across all the disciplines. I really wanted to meet people. I wanted to see how the education worked as a whole system, not just uh, one little corner of the discipline. And um, I manage, but the C-School that I manage is 100% volunteer. We have three staff members, our executive director, program director, and a winter coordinator. Um, so I understand what it is like to work with people that do this for free. And I value that a lot. Um, I work, I've worked for large ski schools. I spent several years at Park City Resort, um, working there and within their adapter program and at, at the regular ski school. I started my career at Mammoth. So I, I've seen kind of all the different corners of the industry. And I really think that I can give, um, some perspective to that. Um, I, believe that we do need to grow from our younger professionals and bring them into the organization, grow it up. Um, I am a mom. I have an 11 year old. He told me a couple of weeks ago that he wants to be an instructor. And that is one of the things that I'm most proud of. Um, I'm excited to have him in our, in our culture, in our community as well. So um, again, um, I feel I have a lot to add. Um, I really want to serve our community, our friends, and our family. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tara. Uh, appreciate those comments. You know, one, one thing that Tara said reminded me of something that I'm looking or I'm currently working on is to put together a proposal for an online learning program that will help us to teach snow sports in different languages and to understand different cultural issues that we have out there. And it's not about teaching somebody how to to flex the ankle or to make a wedge or to do a toe side turn. It's about, hello, my name is, thank you, welcome, do this, watch this, and understanding gestures and vocabulary that we might use that, that might be um, off-putting to some people of different cultures and backgrounds. So um, I'm, I think that a program like that would add a lot of value to us as we're out working and trying to bring more diversity into our sport. So. Anyway, moving right along, we got two names left here. And so pick a name, any name. Charlie. So Charlie uh, Van Winkle is another one of our, our candidates for the election. He unfortunately was not able to make it this evening. So he um, provided a written statement. Um, and I'm just going to read it for you. I haven't read it before, so I apologize on my reading skills here. So, statement of Charlie Van Winkle, uh, February 15th, 2022. Apologies for not being able to deliver this address in person, but we booked a trip to Park City in November, and I'm presently in an airplane heading back east. Thanks to Kathy for reading this on my behalf. As a longtime member of the organization, I'm interested in maintaining its success and wanted to offer my candidacy to help steer leadership in such a way that promotes growth of the membership in new and different directions. I think the retention of certified individuals is a key component towards sustainable success and provides a great foundation. As I indicated in my candidate statement, 
I am excited about the restructuring of the board and I see this as a positive opportunity to affect meaningful changes. I am anxious to hear the results of Kathy's listening tour as a new era within the organization emerges. Shortly before departure for Utah, the East was under a big snowstorm and so we got to enjoy some of the POW before we left. I would love to tell you that we were continuing the powder experience out West but the talking heads on the television news this morning said Utah was experiencing the driest winter, meaning no snow, in 1,200 years. So no snow for the family to enjoy, but that didn't mean we weren't going west. We adapted and adjusted our expectations and created opportunities from the existing conditions. The pandemic over the last two winters has stressed the ski instruction business model, in, has stressed the ski instruction business model in ways never expected or contemplated. There have been some positive outcomes, such as lower instructor-student ratios as implemented on my mountain. Conversely, the ability to find enough qualified personnel challenges ski school management to adhere to the lower ratios. The end message is that we need to adapt to the market, attract and retain individuals who are passionate about our sport, and can help inspire the next generation of skiers and riders. It may take a while to get back to business as usual, or we might use this opportunity to define what the new normal looks like. Either way, I'm excited to be a part of it. As a candidate for my district representative, I have no preconceived notions about what direction it is best, only that I want, would represent membership interest within the region to the best of my ability. I would appreciate your vote in this election and would invite anyone with questions regarding my candidacy to email me at charlievanwinkle at outlook.com and I'll endeavor to respond. Thank you for your interest, Charlie Van Winkle. Thank you, Charlie, for sharing that statement. So, and so that leaves, last but not least, we've got Brandon Bach. Brandon, are you on the line here somewhere? Yes, I am. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon. Cool. So yeah, I'm Brandon. Um, this is my ninth season now with the organization. I am currently a resident of Vermont and work out of a chemo. Um, if the hat didn't give it away, and hopefully I don't lose too many votes by wearing this hat, um, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, PA, actually, and I worked out of Hidden Valley in Seven Springs. <laughs> um, and during my tenure there, um, I attained my Alpine Level 3, CS2, FS1, and Adaptive Level 1. And I've worked in everything from being a kids program instructor to management to uh, being a staff trainer to even on a very desperate weekend, chopping vegetables in the kitchen. And <laughs> so I've, I've been kind of all over the spectrum, you know, with this industry, um, both in terms of my roles and working out of bigger resorts and working at smaller resorts. Um, and I, I feel strongly that my diverse background um, will allow me to not only be a representative of Zone 1, um, but as somebody who can kind of be a, re a representative of the entire Eastern Division. And... As a younger member of the organization at 29, um, who has you know, gone through this development process, uh, that's, that's really brought about my passion for growing our youth and other minority demographics in the organization. Um, I believe that we as an organization need to, uh, need to look at these demographics as more than just something that we need to grow, but as something we need to invest in. And it's, it's most certainly an issue of keeping our organization and industry healthy as our, uh, you know, as our core membership gets older. Um, however, the, I think the super cool thing to think about is if we invest more in youth and get them invested in the development process early, you know, I see it as more of an opportunity to push our entire industry forward and raise you know, an already pretty high bar our organization, our organization and our education staff has set and push it even higher. You know, think about that, that 14 year old Kathy uh, talked about earlier that can now go for their level one and is maybe now thinking about a career in this industry and, you know, maybe even has their eyes now set on the ed staff. You know, how high is that instructor's development cap and potential? Right. And while, you know, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm very passionate about our younger demographics, I'm most certainly not forgetting about our current core. And, I, you know, after having some discussions with some of our longer time members and, you know, highly experienced members, I, I've, I've found that through our discussions that they, they, they're, not, they're often not just concerned with the value that the PSI provides for them, but they also want to feel valued by the organization. 
And, you know, they bring an immense amount of experience, education, and passion for the organization. And, you know, while they maybe aren't looking towards positions like dev team or things like that anymore, they want to contribute and they want to get new members hooked. And I believe there are opportunities to help fulfill some of those desires, you know, in ways that help better engage our current core membership while also helping our industry, our organization, and that next core demographic. And for that, I hope to earn your vote. Thank you, guys. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brandon. All right. So um, before we wrap up, I just want to make a call out to any of the board members that are on the line here. Is there anything in addition that you would like to share with our membership? Awesome. Good. And just to uh, Karen or Don, were there were there any burning questions or comments that we can't leave the table and not have them addressed? I think most of the things in the comments have been addressed. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, you know, just that there are a lot of people wondering where your next stop on your tour is. So you, know, <laughs> you might want to post a schedule. So. <laughs> uh, uh, my 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 plans, like all of you, this coming weekend, I'm going to be at my home hill, Waterville Valley. Uh, out there teaching a bunch of people how to ski and ride for the, the President's Weekend holiday. Um, and beyond that, uh, I will be headed up to Stowe because we have our Women's Summit. Registration is not closed for that event yet. It's the first time this event is being hosted in the East. It is a spectacular event. It is open to every discipline. So that includes our cross-country athletes that are on the phone. Uh, as well as skiers and riders. We have an exceptional group of women that are coming out to lead these groups. We have great electives and activities planned. It is going to be a spectacular event. If you have not registered yet, I believe there's still a few openings. Please go ahead and get signed up um, before the end of the week for that. So that's where I will be. And then after that, we actually are going to be doing a selection for our future examiners on the Alpine squad, our new ACE team members, advanced children's educators, and new members for the development team. And that's gonna be some, if you're looking to see some exciting skiing going on, be up at Stowe the end of that week and uh, there should be some good shows. Uh, so that's what's currently on my agenda. Like I said, at the opening, if you weren't on the line, I am going to be doing a social media contest to find out where Kathy B is gonna go next. And so be looking out for information on that. Some of those bigger trips down South, they were a big trip. It, it, so I tried to make the most of my time down there. Now that um, I've covered a lot of that territory, some of the Eastern areas are easier for me to get to in a day. I just went to Butternut um, on Monday afternoon for a, a regional meeting. So it was easy for me to pop over there and connect. So. Uh, I hope to be doing more of that. And I also am going to be sending out some of the staff to be doing that same outreach as well. So hopefully it's not me. Uh, one of the things you've hopefully seen with me as your new CEO is that getting out there, talking to you, making myself available to hear the comments, I might not be able to do anything about it, but I'm here to listen and to figure out what we can do to make this the best possible organization for all of you. So. Thank you very much for participating tonight. It is important to all of us that we have our voices heard and we get a chance to hear what's going on. And I look forward to seeing you out on there on the Hill. Have a safe and successful holiday week. Thanks guys.